Hello. Hello, please. Yeah, what's the problem, sir? Um, we've just closed down our farm track. Yeah. So, and, uh, feed our pheasants. We've come across a range rover with three people in it. Yeah. It appears that they're, they're dead. I don't know what's happening. Blood in the motor over. Hello, Hello. 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 And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case, or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. The following article comes from the 30th of April 2000, with the headline, Mr Big Behind Trail of Blood. The ecstasy death of Leah Betts on her 18th birthday party sparked national outrage against the evil drug dealers who supplied the pills. Now we can reveal for the first time the anonymous Mr Big behind that fatal consignment of drugs was ruthless Kenny Noy. Britain's number one villain couldn't have cared less about the death of Leah. But a few weeks later, the muscle-bound thugs who ran Noy's Essex drugs empire for him were blasted to death in a snow-covered country lane. Why? It wasn't because dad of two Noy was upset about the death of an innocent girl young enough to be his daughter. The triple execution five years ago was simply carried out because police believe one of the gang had grasped on him. Noy was in prison for handling gold from the £26 million Brinks Mac bullion robbery when he decided the way forward for his crime empire was the rapidly growing drugs business. A hulking 18 stone bodybuilder called Pat Tate, Noy's personal minder in Swellside Prison on the Isle of Sheppey, persuaded him to invest £30,000 in a deal to import ecstasy. Three months later, Tate handed his backer a £70,000 profit. This was the kind of deal that Noy liked. He supplied the finance and organisation, while others did the dirty business of supplying the drug to thrill-seeking teenagers. And when he got out of jail, he applied his greedy mind to making that business even more profitable, regardless of any innocent young lives that might be ruined. Ecstasy could be bought for as little as £2 a tablet in the Netherlands, where Noy still had contacts from his activity smelting down gold from the Brinks Mat robbery. Each tablet was sold in the clubs of Britain for up to £20, a huge markup. Before Noy became involved, the chain from the Netherlands to the UK streets was complex, with the drugs often passing through up to 50 pairs of hands. But a cunning villain cut that down to just five and saw his profits leap. Noy rented a warehouse in London as a distribution centre for thugs like Tate and henchman Tony Tucker. Tate and Tucker then sold the ecstasy onto the street pushers. But the batch they supplied to the pusher, operating in Raquel's club in Bowsden, Essex on the night Leah celebrated her birthday, was double strength. And it cost Leah her life. Three weeks after the national outcry over Leah's death, Tate Tucker and fellow villain Craig Rolfe were lured to White House Farm near Rettendon, Essex, to inspect a landing site for a light plane due to bring in hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of ecstasy. Their host was another of Noy's old associates, 55-year-old Michael Steele. He met the three in a pub and climbed into the back of the Range Rover with Tate, who was so unsuspecting he hadn't bought the 9mm pistol he normally carried. But as the Range Rover turned into a lane off the A130, it had to stop at a closed gate where Steele's accomplice Jack Wombs was hiding. Steele jumped out of the back door as Wombs ran towards the vehicle blasting away with an automatic shotgun. Only Tate had time to put his hands up and crouch down. Tucker and Rolf were killed instantly, sat bolt upright with blood all over their faces and chests. After Wombs reloaded, Steele took the gun and shot each man behind their ears just to make sure. Steele and Wombs are now serving life. But police privately believed Noy, also doing life for Stephen Cameron's murder, commissioned a slaughter. But why did he wipe out his friends? Tate, like Noy, was not averse to giving information to police to save his own skin. In the heat that followed Leah's death, was Noy's involvement one of the tidbits Tate offered to the police? An Essex drug insider says, quote, If it was, then Kenny would have gone fucking bananas. The following article has the title, Gangland Killings Driver Hunt. 
Police investigating the Rettendon gangland killings are appealing for a driver to come forward to help with inquiries. Officers are hoping to trace a motorist who had to brake sharply in icy conditions as an estate car pulled out of Workhouse Lane where the shootings took place. The driver police want to talk to was heading south along the A130 towards Rayleigh at around 7pm on Wednesday, December the 6th last year. The light-coloured estate car pulled out of the lane from the oncoming driver's left, causing the car to brake quickly and so the driver flashed the headlights and possibly gesticulated at the estate car. Police are not concerned with this as a driving incident. The following article comes from the 11th of December 1995 with the headline Police warn of gang war after drug murders. Police investigating the murder of three drug dealers on a remote Essex farm track fear more violence could erupt as rival gangs try to move into the area. Yesterday, as further details emerged of the criminal careers of the three victims, Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley warned that the murders could trigger a turf war. He said, quote, I know that when three people who are involved in drug dealing are taken from the scene, somebody will try to fill the void that is created, he said. I anticipate because of that there will be a power struggle taking place. Potentially there could be more violence. The dead men, Craig Rolfe, 26, Patrick Tate, 37 and Tony Tucker, 38, all from the Basildon area, had been involved in a range of crimes from petty theft to armed robbery. But recent intelligence had shown that they were moving into the drugs trade as wholesalers rather than street traders. They were, said Mr Dibley, quite high up the drug dealing hierarchy, peddling the complete range of illegal narcotics. However, Mr Dibley ruled out any direct connection with Leah Betts, the Essex teenager who died after buying an ecstasy tablet at a Basildon nightclub. He said, quote, There has been a lot of speculation that the killings are linked with the tragic death of Leah Betts. This is pure speculation. There is nothing to link these three men with Leah's death and this suggestion may well divert attention from the real investigation. Mr Dibley said that the men had been threatened. He said, quote, The drugs world is a very murky world. There's been so much publicity in recent weeks. It is clearly easy money, and it is known that there are power struggles among dealers. Police are unclear why the men were murdered. One theory is that they were killed by a rival gang trying to prevent them muscling in on a lucrative trade. He said, quote, There are no signs that any attempt was made to escape from the car. These people were more than street dealers, and it may be that others were trying to prevent them getting into a greater position of power. An alternative police theory was that the deaths of the three men who worked together were linked to an unpaid debt. The post-mortem examination results confirmed that the three men were killed with a shotgun. Seven cartridges were found in the snow close to the car. Rolf, who was in the driver's seat of his Range Rover, and Tucker, who was sitting alongside him, were both shot in the head. Tate, who was in the back seat, died of multiple shotgun wounds. Police are not sure whether the killer arrived in the Range Rover with his victims, and if he had an accomplice. Mr Dibley, who said there was no evidence of a struggle in the car, said, I suspect that these shootings were carried out very quickly. There are no signs that any attempt was made to escape from the car. The post-mortem examination, which was carried out more than 24 hours after the bodies were found at a remote track at Rettendon near Chelmsford, was unable to confirm the time of death. If you would like to learn more about the Range Rover murders, then click on the video in front of you now. You will also see the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. Many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.